All right, this morning let me begin by reading the, um, the verses uh, from Acts chapter 8, verse 25 through verse 40, and then we'll take a look at this passage and see what it teaches us uh, about um, evangelism and about, again, how the kingdom of heaven is expanding at this time. So Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 25, and again, remembering that um, currently... Philip, Peter, and John are all in Samaria. So when it says, it's talking about they, the, the, this is the they they're referring to. So, when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you were reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Again, a remarkable account of things that, that really took place in the history of the church. Now, by way of review, last week, remember, we considered how Jesus advanced his kingdom into Samaria. First, he allowed Saul to hate and to persecute his church, and uh, this motivated the disciples to leave Jerusalem and to go throughout Judea and Samaria, where, honoring their master's command, they shared the gospel with as many people as they could find. Now, again, we saw this was an example of how the Lord uses evil. God allows evil to exist. I mean, He could stop it at any moment, but He doesn't <clears throat> because His plan is to use evil for good, and here's a great example of that, uh, the evil of Saul got the disciples motivated to get out and to share the gospel more broadly, which is, of course, what Jesus wanted them to do. You're going to start in Jerusalem and then in Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And by the way, that is why the Lord allows the evil He does in our world today, because it's meant to provoke us that we might respond to it in a godly way. He wants us to fight against the darkness with the light that He has given to us, the light of the gospel, because that, of course, is what honors Him and will lead other people to honor Him as well. Now, second, this persecution also moved Philip to the city of Samaria. Remember, the Samaritans were those that the Jews hated. Even though Jesus had been there to one of the towns during His ministry, He had not yet evangelized the whole of Samaria so now the Spirit of God moved Philip to the city of Samaria to a people who had for a long time been deceived by Simon the magician. 
But when Philip, of course, came doing real miracles and preaching the gospel, they believed and were baptized. And as we saw, when Peter and John also came down from Jerusalem and laid hands on them, God began giving them His Holy Spirit, which was the evidence that He had received them into His family. Remember, the Lord wanted at least one apostle present when He would breach different people groups, so to speak, so that his church would be united. Actually, we're going to see it wasn't limited just to apostles. Uh, it was limited to those, uh, well, to those who were from the Jerusalem church, we might say, because at that time, the Lord had an interest in keeping all of the new converts that were coming from all different places tied to the Jerusalem church, at least at this time, until the scriptures were completed, so that they might have one standard. They might have the Holy Scriptures. They might have the Bible. Now, this not only shows us how important Scripture is, you know, that, that it's God's revelation, that He wants us to believe what it says and to do what it says, and that He wants the same standard for His whole church, but also how much He wants His church to be one people. Now, today we do comfort ourselves in the fact that it doesn't matter how many denominations there are, the people of God are really one in Christ, and that's certainly true. But I think we'd all admit the Lord would have us all to be one church and one in love for one another and love, uh, really one in belief as well. And it's only because of our sin and our lack of being able to understand as clearly as we should, again, because of sin, that keeps us from being one, but that should be our desire and our prayer, even as it is the Lord's. Well, after they had spent some time there grounding these new converts in the Word, the apostles headed back to Jerusalem, and again, not wasting time, preaching the gospel in the villages of Samaria. And Philip, as we know, was also with them. But before they arrived in Jerusalem, an angel told Philip, to go south, go south, Philip, to the road that led from Jerusalem to, to Gaza. Now, it's a desert road, probably not a lot of people traveling there, certainly because, you know, not many oases, so to speak, uh, perhaps not a desirable way to go. And Philip didn't know why the angel had called him to go there, where this road, you know, might lead to as far as um, opportunity, but he still obeyed the Lord's command through the angel without question, knowing that whatever God had to tell him, whatever God directed him to do, even if he didn't understand it, would still be good because that's God's plan to work everything together for good to those who know him and love him, and Philip certainly did. Now, this morning, we see that there was a goal in mind, of course. We know there always is, and we see the account of the first foreigner, so to speak, absolute foreigner, Ethiopian, and the first eunuch that the Lord graciously brings to Himself. And I want us to see three things from this passage. First of all, the Spirit brings Philip to the Ethiopian. Secondly, the Spirit brings the Ethiopian to Christ. And then thirdly, the Spirit brings Christ to the Ethiopians, basically uses this man to evangelize that country. Now again, that we learn by church tradition. Now, first, we see the Spirit bring Philip to the Ethiopian. Luke writes this in verses 26 and 27. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. I think it's interesting. I don't know how many angels Philip had seen, but he wasn't shocked, alarmed, surprised, didn't fall down on his feet or on his face, but he simply accepted what the angel said and he went. So while he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was redirected by this angel to this road that runs between Jerusalem and Gaza. Let's not forget that uh, Samaria is north of Jerusalem, so they're heading down. And then as um, they approach Jerusalem, he says, bypass Jerusalem and go further south to this road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And I guess from your perspective here, it would be toward the coast here. So going from Samaria to Jerusalem and then to Gaza, which is along the coast. Gaza was one of those Philistine cities that, you know, was situated close to the coast. And that was one, well, basically that was, there was someone there that he wanted Philip to meet. 
Now, notice here that the Lord sent Philip, and he didn't send the angel. And we think about, you know, why doesn't the Lord send the angels? You know, they'd be so much more powerful, so much more confident. Uh, their witness would be so much more, I don't know, impressive, wouldn't it, to, be, to see an angel? But the Lord tells us in His Word that He has not given the work of evangelism to the angels. And you know what? We should see that as a blessing because He has blessed us with that honor. The angels would willingly do this. They would love to have this responsibility and they would love to share this gospel. But the Lord has not commanded them to do that. He has commanded us. He has blessed us with this honor. The work that God does in His mercy and grace, He has done towards mankind. He sent His Son to become a man to save mankind, not to save the angels. And now He sends men, uh, men, women, of course, to reach mankind with this message. He, he sends us to reach others with this message. And He sends the angels to help us do this. You know, the angels not only you know, serve us in the sense that, you know, as we are those who will inherit salvation because of God's mercy and grace upon us and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, but He also sends the angels to strengthen us to do the work the Lord has called us to do. So, we have this honor and we have this further honor of the angels to help us. Now, Philip obeyed the angel without questioning him and uh, without knowing what he would find there. And again, we don't always know why the Lord directs us into a particular path, but we always know that whatever door He opens for us, even though it may mean hardship, is going to end in something good. And that was the case here. What Philip found was a man of great political importance traveling on that road. Luke writes in verse 27, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, as we're heading south, you know, we see that Ethiopia is even further south. You know, Ethiopia is in northeast Africa. If you can picture this, you know, as you move from the Palestine into Africa, you run, first of all, into Egypt. If you go further south, you run into the Sudan. Further south, then you run into Ethiopia. Now, that's a long ways away from Jerusalem. Jesus told them in Acts 1 that they would bring the gospel, remember, after Jerusalem and Samaria or Judea and Samaria, He would bring it to the ends of the earth. Well, here the Lord brought someone from far away, the ends of the earth, to Jerusalem and also, of course, had this, this meeting planned out for Him that He might be exposed to the gospel. Uh, the Lord says in Isaiah 52 verse 10, the Lord has bared His holy arm in the sight of all the nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. So again, we see the Lord fulfilling this promise. Now, this man was an official of Candace, and Candace is not really the name of somebody in particular. Candace is actually a title, kind of like Tsar, like Caesar, like Abimelech, you know, we run to a lot of Abimelechs, we run to a lot of pharaohs in the Scripture. That's not referring to one person. It, it is, of course, if you put another name with it. But it's a title, and it essentially means queen, okay? So she is the queen of Ethiopia. And Ethiopia at that time was the center of commercial trade in Africa. And that's why she was so wealthy. Uh, this official was also in charge of her treasury, which means he was a very important official. And then uh, Luke also tells us that he was a eunuch. And the word can mean uh, several different things. It can mean that he's an official, just simply an official. Or it can mean one who has been emasculated. Or it can mean both. Because we know queens often used eunuchs in their courts, and they used eunuchs because they were less tempted to become corrupt. But now here's the important thing to see and why it is that Luke actually singles out the fact that this man was a eunuch, which makes us believe that he was likely the eunuch of the second variety. He was both, okay? In the Old Testament, a eunuch was not allowed to enter the assembly of the Lord, okay? Now, we 
we read from Isaiah 56 how the Lord was going to open the door for that to take place. But the reason why the door had to be opened was because in the Old Testament, there was a commandment that said they may not enter into the assembly of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't be a part of God's people. That doesn't mean that a foreigner who was a eunuch could not join himself with the Jewish religion. It did mean for whoever happened to be a eunuch that they could not serve as a priest if they happened to be in the line of Aaron, and they could not join with God's people in worship. And we think, well, that you know, it seems kind of harsh, but when you read the Old Testament law, you see that certain priests were excluded from the priesthood because they had any defects in their body. It didn't have to be just that. But God wanted those who did not have any blemishes to be priests, and apparently He also desired that to a certain degree in the assembly that met together uh, to worship Him. He also would not accept blemished animals to be used as sacrifices, this idea of being defective, of being maimed in some way, or of having blemishes excluded them. And I think really the only reasonable explanation of why that was the case is because it was serving as a type of the moral perfection that God expected of anyone who would approach Him. It didn't mean that He didn't love any of them. He didn't care for any of them. He didn't accept any of them. It just simply meant that in His worship, which was a type of the worship of heaven, that nobody who was morally imperfect could ever possibly come into His presence. Now, again, there's a lot of typology in the Old Testament that is meant to teach us of the importance of holiness, moral perfection through physical perfection, okay? We just, that's the way the Lord taught us. He, he gave us, again, physical animals to sacrifice, to show us a very graphic image of what our sins deserve. The Lord was giving pictures of many things He was teaching, so this is one of them. Now, the Lord, though, here is about to breach another ceremonial barrier. Now, He was going to bring this eunuch into His assembly, and more than that, He was going to bring him into His family. And as we read from Isaiah 56, give him a name that is better than natural sons and daughters who may not actually know Him. Most of the Jews did not know Him, but God was going to bless this eunuch, this foreigner, with a status, with a name, which of course means he belongs to the Lord, something that was better than what he had given to the Jews, what he gives to those who actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, regarding this man, we don't really know if he was already a full convert to Judaism. Uh, there are some forms of, of uh, what would you call it, uh, creating eunuchs, but actually had made that impossible. We don't know that that's the case or if the man was simply a God-fearer, okay, one who accepted the God of Israel but who had not been circumcised. Now, it's interesting when you think about this because if he was a God-fearer, that means that he was not a full Jew. That means that he was actually a Gentile. And that would mean that Peter was not the first to go to the Gentiles and that Cornelius was not the first Gentile to be saved. It was this Ethiopian. He was also a Gentile, unless he was a full convert to Judaism. Let's not forget, to be a Jew does not mean that you were necessarily descended from Abraham. It doesn't mean that you were physically, racially, so to speak. And again, there's really only one race in the world, and that's mankind. We're all related to one another through Adam and Eve. We're all related to one another through Noah. We're just different shades of the same color, so we don't want to think about necessarily... Uh, race, okay? But it's a religion, okay? Jewish, to be Jewish means you, that you are holding to the God of Israel, you've been circumcised, and you're a part of God's people. So even Gentiles who proselytize to Judaism become Jews, they're no longer Gentiles. So if this man had not become a Jew, he's a Gentile, this is actually the first Gentile convert. But either way, we know this man believed in Yahweh, Likely in his work doing commerce in, in Africa, he came into contact with somebody who was a Jew. And, uh, you know, because, well, again, through his work as Candace's official, and was converted. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship him. Well, this is the one to whom the Spirit led Philip. That's why he told him to go down. Well, secondly, we see the Spirit bring the Ethiopian to Jesus. 
Now, the official had already been to Jerusalem. He had already worshipped the Lord. He had already shown him his love and respect. He believed that Yahweh was the true God, the only God of the world. And now he was returning to his own country. And as he traveled, he was reading the scroll of Isaiah. I think we know as believers, there's nothing better that we can read than the Scriptures. Nothing that will encourage us and strengthen us more. And let me just say that we're never going to become what God intends for us to be in this life unless we read it, unless we believe it, unless we also put it into practice. Well, the, the eunuch was reading the scroll of Isaiah. The Spirit told Philip to join the chariot, and when he approached it, he heard the man reading. Now, here's, I think, what we would call a God-ordained opportunity, Right? One of the more challenging things to do when we want to share the gospel with someone else is to look for that, that entrance, right, for that icebreaker to start the conversation. And then another challenge is once we actually have it, to be able to take advantage of that opening uh, when the Lord gives it. Now here, the Lord provides Philip not only with the icebreaker, not only with the entrance, but He also gives him the courage. And let me just say the the more you share the gospel with other people, the easier it becomes. The more courageous you become because you see it isn't quite so daunting after all. People will listen to you and even if they don't like what you have to say, you will still be so blessed. So as he walks alongside the chariot and he hears the official reading, he asks him the question, very natural question, do you understand what you were reading? The official's response was another open door, and he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Now, remember, we often say this, but we don't seem to understand how true it is that the gospel is in the Old Testament, but it's concealed, right? And it's revealed in the New Testament. The New Testament gives us the key to the Old Testament so that we can much better understand it. Now, this man didn't have the New Testament, hadn't been written yet, and the only people who actually had the truth were the apostles and the disciples. So this man could essentially read Isaiah all day long. He could read it all the way back to Ethiopia. He could be reading it for the next year and still not know what it meant unless someone helped him. Now, again, think about this. Um, that is the reason why we need to talk to other people about the gospel is because they don't understand either. And I'm not saying that they're going to believe if they do understand, but I'm going to say this, that the Lord has sent us to explain it to them so that they might understand. Now, apparently, while this man was in Jerusalem, he had not come into contact with any of the apostles, and that's likely because Saul's persecution had driven them underground. He had forced some to run and some into hiding. Otherwise, Saul would have dragged them in, into jail and uh, put them on trial. Now, if this official had met the apostles, perhaps he would have been saved, but he hadn't. But yet the Lord was still determined to have mercy on him. I mean, this is the Lord orchestrating all these things, isn't he? He's bringing Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch so that he might come to Christ. Now, notice... Next, the fact that the man had a book to read. He was reading the scroll of Isaiah. We think that everybody was carrying scriptures around with them in those days. But really, each synagogue had their own copy of the scriptures, and unless you were wealthy, you could not afford even to have a copy of any of it, except maybe what you would have written down, but uh, you probably wouldn't have had materials that were good enough to preserve what you could remember. So only the wealthy had copies of the scriptures and here's another indication of this man's importance, that he could afford to have his own scroll. Well, he had been reading it out loud, maybe because he's more auditory. Some of us are like that. Maybe because he wanted other people to hear what he was reading. Or maybe because he was simply reviewing what he had been taught in Jerusalem. You know, when you go to the temple, you hear the teacher's teaching. He was trying to understand, what does this passage mean? When Philip asked whether he understood, he said no. So then he invited Philip to come and join him. And I mean, again, think about God's providence. He was reading Isaiah 53. 
a passage, perhaps the passage in the Old Testament above all the others that talks about the work of Christ and His suffering. And again, we see the Spirit's guiding. Jonathan Edwards once said this, that when God determines to bring someone to Himself, He makes everything conspire together to bring that person, which means He makes everything work together. Philip, go down to this road, okay? So Philip goes, and then he has this guy, he's preparing him by, you know, he's been to Jerusalem, and he's reading the Scripture. And these are the particular verses he was considering, verses 32 and 33 in our text. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? for his life is removed from the earth. Now, his question to Philip was this. Was Isaiah speaking about himself or was he talking about someone else? And so here's the open door. I'll tell you who he's talking about. Philip said he's talking about Jesus, that Jesus would willingly lay down his life, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order that he might save all who trust in him. That's basically the gospel in a nutshell. Now, they probably spent some time together because, um, you know, they, they did run into some water eventually, and I think Luke already pointed out that this is a desert road, which means there's not a lot of water along the way. But when the Ethiopian official sees the water, he, he basically says, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? How did he know about baptism? Well, it's because Philip taught him. Now, this may seem like a rather quick baptism, especially in our circles today, right? Because we spend a lot of time making sure that the person who comes to us understands the truth, believes that truth, professes to trust in Jesus, and has a life that's consistent with it. And that takes a little bit of time to kind of get, get that instruction out because a lot of people come into the church today without any background at all. Now, we do have to admit this official had a background in Judaism, and so did Saul, of course, when, when he was converted. So we should assume here that Philip was convinced that this man had the qualifications. Can I be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The man replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, think about this. The man had to believe the truth. He had to believe the truth regarding Christ. He couldn't have a false gospel and be baptized. It doesn't matter how much we think we love the Lord, if we don't believe the truth regarding the gospel, then we really aren't saved. We can't be saved apart from the truth. And there are, of course, those, those foundational things we need to believe, which most churches today teach. I say all, all true churches teach, but you know, most of them that call themselves churches do that. But in the same way, it doesn't really matter whether we know and believe the truth about Jesus Christ if we do not love Him, if we do not show Him that we do love Him by obeying Him, we still don't know Him, okay? So the, these two things have to be there. The right knowledge about who Jesus is and what He has done and how you receive salvation and the evidence that I have truly been born again because I, I love Him and I want to do what He calls me to do. Well, that's what the Ethiopian official professed to, and on this profession, Philip baptized him. Now, finally, we, we note what we don't see in the text here. We, a couple things we do see, some things we don't. We see the Spirit use this man to bring Christ to Ethiopia. We read in verses 39 and 40, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Now, the first thing we see here is the Spirit directs Philip to his next place of service, okay? As they came up from the water, the Spirit compelled Philip to leave. Now, we don't know exactly how this transport took place. I mean... <laughs> There's a, uh, an apocryphal story that has nothing to do with Philip uh, about somebody who was picked up by the Spirit and basically like a great hand just kind of moved him across country. And we don't know whether he was miraculously transported or whether the Spirit of God just basically compelled him 
to go straightly there, and it's really not that important. The important thing is this, though. This official, as I mentioned before, he was an educated man, and he understood Judaism. And as he learned about Christ from Philip, things had likely fallen into place, as they would later for Saul, who becomes Paul. And so Philip didn't need to stay and spend time teaching him any further. And so the Spirit takes him to Azotus, which is the Greek name of the ancient Philistine city of Ashdod. You know, Gaza, Ashdod, we're talking about along the coast, that's where the Philistines were. And that was located 30 miles north of Gaza. So Philip maybe had to finish his trek down to Gaza and then head 30 miles up uh, to um, Azotus. And starting from there, he went through all the cities preaching the gospel until he came to Caesarea, which is located 58 miles to the north of Azotus along the coast of the Mediterranean. And Luke will tell us later in Acts 21, Philip settles down there. He appears perhaps if he wasn't married before, he gets married. And then he has a few daughters who are prophetesses. The Lord continues to bless him. So the Lord was finished with Philip in one area. And so he moves Philip on to another. And we see the same thing going on in the book of Acts that we saw during Jesus' ministry. Once you've finished here, go to another place because there's a lot of places that need to be reached with the gospel. So that should be a reminder to us, you know, not to, to spend our whole lives trying to evangelize one person. You know, let's reach out to others, try the best we can to reach as many as we can. As for the Ethiopian, he went on his way rejoicing. Now that he belonged to Jesus, now that he was saved, now that he could truly glorify the Lord. And when he arrived in his own country, we'll assume that he continued his work for God's glory and honor. But now here's where we get to church tradition. This official is said to have brought Christ to Ethiopia. One commentator writes this, There is a tradition that Candace was herself converted to Christianity by her treasurer on his return, and that he became the apostle of Christianity in that whole region, carrying it also into Abyssinia, which is basically one of the states within the country of Ethiopia. It is said that he also preached the gospel in Arabia, Felix, and in Ceylon, where he suffered martyrdom. Now, we don't know that for sure. That's basically what uh, some church historians have, have said. But it sounds reasonable, doesn't it, that this man would use his power, his wealth, his influence now to serve the Lord, realizing that he couldn't take it with him, obviously, and, and that was no longer his desire. But his desire was to use everything he was and everything he had for the glory of Christ. So the Lord not only brought him into his family and gave him a name better than that of his natural family, he used him powerfully to bring honor to his name. Now, you know as well as I do that he's willing to use us as well if we only want to be used and if we make ourselves available. And we know that he's able to use anyone who is willing to be used as we see throughout the book of Acts, as we see throughout the Scriptures. So may the Lord give us grace to be willing to serve Him. And again, to return to the Lord the love that He has shown us in giving us His Son, that we would give ourselves to Him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord uh, to give us the grace to do that and to want to be used as Again, the eunuch wanted to be used as Philip wanted to be used as all these disciples desired that God would use them.